Hello and welcome to Chawton House's Lockdown Literary Festival. My name is Cleo O'Sullivan and I'm going to be talking about Man Up, Women Who Stepped Into a Man's World. And this is Chawton House's 2020 exhibition, which I curated. And I'm going to talk about how the exhibition came to be, its genesis, its early inspirations, how it took shape, how it formed and how it became what it is today. So without further ado, let's begin. So the work that really sparked my interest and really started the whole thing is this right here, the history of Miss Betsy Warwick, the female rambler. And I was actually sitting in on someone else at Chawton House. They were talking about the rare books in the collection. And I've worked at Chawton House for many years now, and the collections are just so vast that even if I worked there 100 years more, I don't think I would be fully, fully acquainted with everything that was there. So I couldn't resist going, really, especially when they were looking at the best stuff in there. And she pulled out this very tiny work. It's a chapbook. And just to give you some context, a chapbook is um, a kind of penny book that you'd buy. It's sort of like adventure yarns, trash novels. It's sort of uh, books for, for anyone to have, really. Um, and she pulled out this and just described the story to me. Um, and I just was instantly captivated. It's about Miss Betsy Warwick. She's confined to a nunnery, although she's got a lover on the outside who breaks her free by lending her male clothing. And she falls into a series of mishaps and adventures and her lover, she believes, is killed in a duel. And there's a sort of illustration of her over his prostrate body. And here's a close-up of that. So there she is in male clothing, believing that he's dead. And she decides to go on rambles around the countryside. She gets into a duel at one point with the man she believes has killed her lover. Um, and above, above um, her, she resides this quote, men some to business, some to pleasure take, but every woman is at heart a rake. And the original quotation is steeped in misogyny because Alexander Pope said it, so boo to him. But within this context, um, it's kind of reclaimed about Betsy Warwick. She's sort of taking her life into her hands and um, engaging in this sort of freewheeling existence. And as you all kind of see, my justification for Man Up is that a lot of ideas and gender expectations are turned on their heads and reclaimed. Even the term man up, which is steeped in toxic masculinity, um, I apply to women who step into a man's world. So it's women who are literally manning up. Um, so I wanted to turn something negative into something positive. So once I was hooked on the quite vague notion of women inhabiting male spaces, I decided to pull on the thread and see where it took me. Um, so delve into our collection and see if there were any other instances where women manned up in a literal sense. And turns out quite a lot of them did. And they all had fascinating lives. So take, for instance, on the left, a narrative of the life of Mrs. Charlotte Chark. So Charlotte Chark was a West End actress. She was uh, the daughter of a very, very famous figure on the West End stage. He was the manager of the Drury Lane, and he was known as sort of the greatest actor of his day. Um, so she kind of had famous roots anyway. But um, if you look close up, chapter four of her autobiography, which she wrote. Um, her adventures in men's clothes, going by the name of Mr. Brown and being beloved by a lady of great fortune who intended to marry her. So I thought, well, she's had a, quite the life. You carry on looking down. Her turning pastry cook and in Wales with several extremely humorous and interesting occurrences. As I was reading it, I thought, well, I'll say you've certainly had plenty of that. So Charlotte Chark, as an actress, was known for taking on the breeches role. So think if she could play Viola in Twelfth Night, she definitely would have done that. Um, and then if I move on to the picture on the right, um, this is 
a diagram of Hannah Snell in her regimentals. So Hannah Snell joined the army and joined the navy. She took on a male persona in pursuit of her husband who had absconded and had a very successful career, according to her. What's interesting is both of these women were real. These aren't fictional accounts, and they both put pen to paper and wrote their stories, or at least recorded their stories, even if they didn't write them themselves. So here is Hannah Snell depicted in her regimentals, because after she received a pension um, for her services for the British Navy, she then took to the stage and would perform uh, manual exercises of soldiers. And the crowd loved it and they went wild for it. So I carried on down this research rabbit hole. And what became clear was that the exhibition was starting to take shape, but it was quite a monumental task to undertake. And I knew I'd have to delve into the collection at Chawton House, which as you can see from this lovely picture, is by no means a hardship. It's absolutely wonderful to carry out any research. It's really, really just a privilege. But I did need some help and help came in the form of our summer intern, Becca O'Mara, who was so wonderful and really got the brief of what we were looking for. And so the pair of us spent summer just looking for any stories that fit this idea of women stepping into a man's world. And there were several items in the collection that were a must for me to include. I've already mentioned Charlotte Chark and her story, as well as Hannah Snell. Of course, the history of Miss Betsy Warwick as she's rambling around the countryside in her male disguise and getting herself into duels and all the rest of it. But I also wanted to include women who weren't manning up in a literal sense the way these three were. So take, for instance, Elizabeth Knight, who was the only female proprietress of Chawton House and incredibly formidable woman and also rare because not only did she wield so much power, but she seemed to really relish the power that she had. She, she wasn't shy about ordering her steward to carry out her wishes. She took a really active, decisive role in running the estates at Chawton House. She had two husbands, both of whom she outlived, both of whom had to take her surname. So again, she's manning up in a sort of more metaphorical sense, she is bossing it, basically. <laughs> I also wanted to include Georges Sand, whose portrait, this portrait, in, in fact, that we have at Chawton House. Georges Sand was a French writer, contemporary of Victor Hugo, and in fact was much more popular than Victor Hugo in, in their day. She outsold his novels in England which when you consider everyone knows Les Mis, Victor Hugo's most famous work, and yet hardly anyone knows what Georges Sand's most famous work is. Georges Sand actually isn't her real name. That is an androgynous nom de plume. And I say androgynous because you hear George Sand, you think that's male. But actually in France, Georges without an S is actually not male. So she's really making a point about gender and androgyny there and had such an interesting life herself, sort of was part of the aristocracy, uh, yet refused to conform. She wore male clothing, she smoked in public, so very much an advocate for human rights. So interesting woman, worth including. And this figure, Marianne Talbot, not dissimilar to Hannah Snell, uh, both joined the Navy, both uh, had their accounts written of their, their time. And interestingly, uh, this, this account of Marianne Talbot we have documented in our novels online. So if you're looking for something free to read during lockdown, then why not give Marianne Talbot a try? She gets shot in the line of fire. Very unpleasant. Spoiler alert, I won't say what happens, but read it and you'll find out. And as well, 
as looking at all these women, I wanted to include the Brontes because we have such a lovely collection of Bronteana that was donated to us. And the Brontes fit the bill as well because they used androgynous nom de plumes. They wrote under the names Cura Acton and Ellis Bell. So they're not writing under specific male names, although most people did assume that their works were written by men at the time. But they are disguising their gender because they want their work to be judged on its merit alone rather than the fact that it was women writing these great novels. And how could I not include the great mother of feminism, Mary Wollstonecraft, the hyena in petticoats herself, as she's called. I mean, if anyone is manning up in a world that wants women to conform, then surely this is she. So I had a concept. I had items in the collection that I wanted to include. I wanted to have a very striking visual representation of the exhibition. And the picture that really, really captured it for me was this one of the Chevalier Deon. Um, and the Chevalier, in case you don't know, was born a man and was a French spy and lived for several years as a woman. And it's it really evokes the sense of women trying to step into a man's world. However, using this image leads to several problems. First of all, we don't have anything on the Chevalier in the collection, so I can't really use an image that I'm not going to use in the exhibition. And also it's problematic because it's the wrong way around. I'm talking about women manning up, so women entering into a man's world, whereas the Chevalier did it the other way around. And not wanting to get too into gender discourse, um, the Chevalier has been claimed by some as sort of quite an important trans figure. So having um, the strong statement of man up next to someone who is born a man but attempting to live as a woman is, um, yeah, it's, it's problematic. This is actually um, the kind of early version of the logo. And as you'll see, my slogan is just not very brief or succinct. It's women who dare to make their own way in a man's world. I was troubleshooting at the time, but you get, you get the point. Now it's man up, women who stepped into a man's world. However, I couldn't get away from how effective the Chevalier was, but I thought, could we create something from our own collection that evokes that? So I took one half of Charlotte Chark when she's in a dress, and the other half of Hannah Snell when she's in her regimentals, and created dun, 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 this very lovely logo. And it's it's great because it's two sympathetic images that come together, um, but it's our own. And so it's much more relevant to the exhibition, which was, of course, important. Um, but also anyone who is familiar with the Chevalier Deon might recognise what we're trying to do and see that we're kind of going, using it as an inspiration. So, so I had a concept. I had a logo, I had items in the collection I wanted to use. Now I just needed the exhibition to take shape. And the way I wanted the narrative to flow was to theme the exhibition into categories. So beginning with soldiering, and that's when I talk about Hannah Snell and Marion Talbot. And then I would talk about pirating. So. Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, those famous female pirates of the golden age of piracy. And then dueling, and that's when I talk about uh, Betsy Warwick. And also talking about Belinda, the novel by Mariah Edgeworth, because if anyone who's read the, the novel, they'll know that it's uh, quite an important plot point of women donning male clothing and getting into duels. So the first half of the exhibition is sort of talking about women manning up in a literal sense and in quite a violent sense. Then we move on to landowning. That's when we talk about 
Elizabeth Knight, who perhaps is an inspiration for the matriarchal figures in Jane Austen's literature. Jane Austen would have been aware of Elizabeth Knight, but more on Elizabeth Knight in one of our other talks in the exhibition, so no spoilers here. Then I was talking about acting, which is Charlotte Chark, of course, taking on the breeches roles and that history of breeches roles and how popular they were in the 18th century. Then talking about ballooning and how Lady Aeronauts were at the vanguard of the ballooning craze. And again, there's another talk on ballooning, so I'll say no more on that. And finally, ending on writing, women's writing, because of course, Chawton House's Bread and Butter is our women's writing collection. So I had my concept, I had the shape of the exhibition, then I wanted to create a colour scheme. And the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice it's very pink. And really that was just about another way of turning gender expectations on its head. Pink is so associated with femininity and can be in quite a dismissive way. And I thought, what better way to touch upon the absurdities of what it means to be female and feminine than including a pink palette? Curating this exhibition has been my utter joy. It has been such a privilege and I have truly, truly loved putting it together. It's the first exhibition I've ever curated and whilst it was a lot of work, it was really so worth it. It opened on March 3rd, but then of course, we all know what happened. Um, coronavirus struck the whole world down. We had to close as did everyone. And I know that these problems within the grand scheme of things can seem quite small and infinitesimal, but um, it was heartbreaking that all this work had gone into curating Man Up and the idea that no one was going to see it was really, really quite disheartening. But never fear, you can still see Man Up. It's moved completely online, which is very exciting. And also it means anyone who could never have come to Chawton House, even if we had been open because of distance or travel, means that they can see it. So some good has come out of it in a way. And as you can see on the sidebar, uh, you'll be able to click through into the various themes of the exhibition. There's some fun things on there as well. There's an activities page. Uh, for instance, this, what is your androgynous nom de plume? And this is something that I made up. So we're gonna have a go at giving me my androgynous nom de plume. So C for Cleo, Cura. Month of birth, January, career ton. I feel like I'm giving too many personal details away. My mother's maiden name is, no, I'm joking. Um, surname initial or kest. Thus, my androgynous nom de plume is Curriton or kest. Does it have a nice ring to it? Will you be seeing any bestsellers once we can go back to bookshops? Who knows? A disclaimer, not all of them completely work. Some of them are pure nonsense, but it's just a bit of fun. So it's kind of modelled off the Brontes nom de plumes because, of course, they're not using, using real names. They're kind of making names up, so Cura, Acton, Ellis, etc. And if you want to find out more about the exhibition, then you can go online and listen to a special podcast interview with me where I talk about the items that are on display in greater detail. You'll even see a little picture of me on there, dressed up or manned up, if you like. Thank you so much for listening. I've really enjoyed talking about this. And if you've enjoyed any aspect of this or indeed our digital content that we've been putting out uh, or the Lockdown Literary Festival, then please do consider donating to Chawton House's Emergency Appeal. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of the Lockdown Literary Festival. <laughs>